you'd like all to open up to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13. And we are back in our series going through uh, expositing the book of Acts verse by verse. And we will be looking at Acts 13 verses 1 through to 12 this morning. And follow along as I read. The word of God says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them when they had gone through the whole island as far as Pathos. They came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He, he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Alamus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, with you will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And that is the word of the living God. Let us now pray. Our Lord and our mighty God, our all authority has been given to you. And Lord, you have told your church to now go and proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, both here and to the ends of the earth. And we see in this portion of Scripture the faithfulness to follow the Lord's mission of Paul and Barnabas. And Lord, now as we come upon this passage here 2,000 years later, I pray that you would do a work of the Holy Spirit among us, that you would convict us, uh, reprove us, Raise us in the way of righteousness, Lord, that we would be faithful to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the 19th century lived an author and a hymn writer named Elizabeth Payson Prentice. Now, she grew up in a home that loved the Lord. In fact, her father led the family in prayer three times a day. And while she had an exemplary faith, and while she showed immense patience and contentment to, throughout her life, or while she, had the, she, she showed these things due to chronic illness that she experienced most of her life, as well as looking after a sick husband. Uh, in fact, in a three-month period in 1842, uh, her two young children died. And later, Prentice wrote in a letter saying this, to love Christ more. This is the deepest need, the constant cry of my heart, down in the bowling alley and out in the woods and on my bed, when I am happy and busy and when I am sad and idle, the whisper keeps going up for more love, more love, more love. Uh, she wrote that famous hymn, More Love to Thee. Such Christian patience and piety through her sufferings, such contentment, and yet 
in her desire for more of Christ, she lived with discontentment. This kind of tension that follows every Christian or believer, everyone who loves the Lord. There is a tension of loving Christ and being content in Him and then this discontentment of wanting more of Him to see more of His glory go forward. We see this in the Apostle Paul. He said, not that I am seeking or speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Philippians 4.11. And yet in Romans 7, we see this discontent. I do the things I don't want to do. Yes, Lord, I'm righteous in you, but yet I see an unrighteousness coming up in my own spirit. Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs wrote the classic book on contentment, and in it, he said that a Christian is the most contented man in the world and yet the most unsatisfied man in the world. While being content and discontent at the same time seems somewhat contradictory, but the Bible presents these two truths. And I'm sure you experience them in your own life. While loving God and being thankful for my love for the Lord, I long for more love. While well, knowing what I know about God, yet I long to know him more. Knowing that I'm righteous in Christ, but I long to be more righteous. Knowing that the gospel is going out and the glory of God is being presented from unsaved people being saved, I long for the glory to be expanded throughout the world. This kind of tension of loving God, being content in him, and yet still discontent. And I think we see this kind of paradox here, at least the discontented aspect, in the church at Antioch. In the church here at Antioch. He, they seem to be doing so well, but yet they are longing for the unsaved to be saved, for the curses of God to be captivators of God, for the worshippers of idol, of idols of self and money and work to be worshippers of God. This is a beautiful church. We saw this back in chapter 11. They love the word. They love to share the word of God. They love to give generously to the work of God. But they longed to see God do more and more work through their church and in their midst. And then at the end of chapter 11, if you can remember, and we sort of then left chapter 11, it went to an episode of Peter being put in prison, and now we're back really picking up verse 1. It's, it's like we left verse 30 in chapter 11, now we pick it up in verse 25, actually, of chapter 12. So notice... In verse 30 of chapter 11, it says that Paul and Barnabas, basically they took the offering that was collected to take it to the church at Jerusalem. And then in verse 25 of chapter 12, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service of taking the offering, bringing with them John, whose name was Mark. Now, we don't know why Paul and or Saul and Barnabas returned, but it would seem to be they loved this church. Uh, they had already spent a year teaching this church. Maybe they loved their zeal for the gospel. Maybe they loved just the general diversity of the people that lived in a cosmopolitan city. They loved their hunger for Christ, their generosity for Christ's people. In a sense, Paul or Saul and Barnabas at this time had found the perfect church. Paul had had a revelation put on his life that he would be used of Christ to reach the nations. And now they come to this church and the nations have reached Antioch. Because again, this was like the, uh, the, the perfect place between north, south, east and west, the converging, the melting pot of all nations. And they come to this church and no doubt they love the church 
And the temptation for Paul and Barnabas could be saying, man, we have found the place of God's ministry for us. This is fantastic. I'm enough away from Jerusalem that I can sort of usurp or extend my own God-given leadership and authority. These were gifted leaders. It would be a great place for them to stop and be used of the Lord. That's nothing wrong with that. To be content in the place where the Lord has them. It's the same experience of temptation Peter had uh, in Mark chapter 1 when Jesus was doing a miraculous work in Capernaum. Uh, He was healing people. He was uh, exercising demons out of people. People were coming by the thousands. It says all the city had come around the door of Simon Peter's mother-in-law's place receiving the word of God and, um, and, and being healed. And Jesus wakes up early and goes and prays on a mountain. And Peter comes to him and says, where have you been? Everyone is looking for you. In other words, what are you doing? The revival has started. It's all happening back in Capernaum. Don't mess this up. We've already printed the T-shirts. We've got the cups saying, um, (laughs) saying, impact Capernaum. We just need you now to come and preach. What does Jesus say? Let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. It would be great to have a wonderful ministry in Capernaum with Christ, but Jesus had a different mission, and that was to preach the gospel to those who had not heard. And the church at Antioch was cut with the same cloth of Christ that had a, in a sense, a godly discontent, a healthy discontent, not to be bedded down, but to send the gospel, to see the kingdom of Christ expanded, to go to nations, to cities, to towns, to families, living in darkness that they might see a great light. Derek Thomas is right when he says, the gospel is never meant to be kept And preserved like the crown jewels in the Tower of London, the gospel is to go forth to spread. An interesting statistic that they believe that 85% of the growth in conversions to Christianity occur through the ministry of churches five years and under. Why is that, I wonder? We get content. Look at us. We've got so many people here. There is, there's enough elders. There is enough for us to do. We don't need to be doing anything else. That's, that's, the, um, that's the temptation. But it's those churches five years and under that perhaps there's this need to see the gospel go out. But then when the numbers start to grow, it's like we're in maintenance mode. I love... Um, the, what, uh, the, the pastors and elders of Darren Middleton's church do. This is Darren Middleton was the camp speaker, uh, and he's in a Presbyterian church in North Geelong. They basically decided that when they hit at numbers of 150, they, they're praying and they've got a leadership process of raising up church planters, but then they peel off a third of those people to go and plant another church in an area that need the gospel. It's like they've got this... This, this discontent, to, godly discontent to see the gospel keep moving forward because that's what Christ called us to do, is it not? And so what do we learn from the church of Antioch regarding godly discontent for the glory of God? If you'd like to put the first point up, please. It, what we have is the first point is the godly discontented person will pursue God in fasting and prayer. We'll pursue God in fasting and prayer. I want you to notice the posture, first of all, of these people in Antioch. But before we get there, let's just get a lay of the land to remind us where we're at in the book of Acts. You can remember that uh, uh, Jesus gave the marching orders to the church in Acts 1.8, saying that you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, uh, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. 
And then the, the book of Acts basically follows that. We see the focal point is Jerusalem and Peter. And then it moves really to Philip as he takes the gospel to Judea and Samaria. And now it's moving and we're at this leverage point, this moving point, um, where the gospel now starts to reach the ends of the earth through the Apostle Paul. He will start his first missionary journey uh, in our text. And uh, Barnabas will be with him. So the focus now is going out through Paul. And they are in a church here in Antioch. It is a very diverse church. Notice the people, for it says that in Antioch there were prophets and teachers. Uh, Now that probably is a description of these men. Prophets and teachers. Barnabas, he's already a leader in Jerusalem and a native of Cyprus. Uh, There is, or Cyprus, there is Simeon, uh, who is called uh, Niger, and he, this, Niger means men in black, so he could well be African. Then there is another Gentile named Lucius, who was from Cyrene, and that is in North Africa. And then there is Manaean, and surprisingly, he is actually the lifelong friend, uh, friend of Herod the Tetrarch, which is Herod Antipas. This is the Herod that killed John the Baptist and was at Jesus' trial. This man in Antioch, the leader of the church, was actually a lifelong friend being brought up in the household of uh, Herod. It's remarkably diverse. When I talk about the the power of the gospel to break into various people's lives. And then you have Saul, the rabbi. Now, this is a a powerhouse church. Think of the staff pastors at this church. They are a dynamic bunch. You have prophets and, and teachers Uh, whose heart burned for the renown of Christ. And they then it says in verse 2 that they lead their people. Now, I want you to see, commentators would say that while they were worshipping, this is ultimately the church. So you've got the elders of the church leading their whole congregation here in worship and fasting. Verse 3, fasting and prayer. These men are called by God, they are being used by God, and what do they do? They get on their knees and they fast and pray. Strategy, vision, gifting, talents all have their place in the church, but they are always subservient to seeking the direction and power and enabling of the Holy Spirit to do the work of God. We can visionize, strategize all we want but ultimately that's all subservient to being on our knees for Christ and seeking his direction. Worshipping, fasting, and prayer are often the posture of God's people when they are burdened with an urgent desire for God's glory. You see this in Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah, who is in Babylon, being taken captive in exile. There comes a contingency from Jerusalem to Babylon. And Nehemiah asks after the remnant back in Jerusalem. And they say to him, the remnant is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. In other words, God's people are in great hardship. God's people are being mocked. God's walls of Jerusalem, which is the holy city, if that succeeds, God gets the glory. The nations are ultimately laughing, blaspheming the name of God. What does Nehemiah do at this point? It says, as soon as I heard these things, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. And then I began to seek God in fasting and prayer. Where were the other men who saw this? Where was their heart? Where were their prayers? Where was their fasting? It's all ruined, they said. The gospel's not powerful enough. They might have thought, well, of course, because the people are in sin. The enemy is too great. The the culture is too hardened to the gospel. We see this in our own midst in complaining against whatever it is. 
It took a cupbearer all the way in Babylon who agonized for the name of God, who had a godly discontent that drove him to his knees and he called out to God. And God used this praying man, not a man who would have some sort of flash of emotion and say, let's do this. He was a man who spent days in prayer and fasting and God used him, surprisingly, to bring about the ultimate revival and restitution of Jerusalem. The church in Antioch worshipped and fasted and prayed in order to discern God's will, in order that they might get clarity on what God is calling them to do, where he wants them to go. They were doing all the right things, I'm sure. They were preaching the gospel. People are coming, but Lord, what more? We've got capable people in our midst. What more do you want? What direction should we take? What priorities should we set? So they abstained from food and perhaps water for the purpose of focusing their thoughts and their energies on ultimately God, to worship in him, to read in his word, to listen in for his guidance. And I know this sounds really weird, but God expects his people, both individually and corporately, at times to do the same thing. To fast? Yes. To fast. To lay aside all our distractions, to focus on him. God expects his people to follow after him who was one Jesus who fasted and prayed. This is one activity that I believe is missing from the evangelical church, certainly in the West. Fasting and seeking God. We live in ease. We live in luxury and comfort, and we would prefer to do so much more than fast and pray. Praying is not the process of getting to the work. Praying is the work. Fasting is not the process of getting to the work. Fasting is the work. That's why we find it so hard. You know, as I was writing this out this week, I've got an Indian pastor friend who's in India. And I thought, I might just write to him. Because quite often the, the, the guys in non-Western countries get this. And I said, um, brother... How often does your church fast and pray? He wrote back to me within minutes, actually, and said that every week, Saturday, they give over to fasting and praying for Sunday. Once a month, at the end of the month, they spend the last three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the last Sunday, fasting and praying, and then they have a big meal on the end of um, Sunday. Now, it's okay. I'm not going to force anything. I'm just, <laughs> don't eat! <laughs> Now, there's a little bit of a rebuke. What do, the, what do these guys know? I mean, we got the doctrine. We, you know, we can teach them a thing or two. They can also teach us a thing or two. Fasting and praying. Sounds old-fashioned, and yet the church of Antioch were only following what Moses did, what Elijah did, what Nehemiah did, what Daniel did, and what Jesus did, and what so many church fathers have done. First point. Godly discontentment will lead to his people pursuing him in fasting and prayer. Second, godly discontented people will be submissive to the Spirit despite the cost. See, when you fast and pray and seek God's face for the expanse of his own glory, be sure that God will begin to do a work in your heart and in his church. It happened to Nehemiah. Lord, look at the reproach of your people and your name. God says, use, now I'm going to use you. You're the guy after God's own heart. I want to use you. Antioch say, ultimately, look at the nations. We can't hold the gospel the Holy Spirit says, verse 2, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. When we fast and when we pray and when we seek 
God in his word, we begin to take on his heart and his burden. Please understand, world missions does not start in the heart of man. It starts in the heart of God. And you'll only get his heart when you pursue him. And part of that heart is a desire to see the gospel expand. And the people to come to a saving knowledge of him. He is the one who is seeking to save in the lost. We just got to get on board with the program. And how does the Holy Spirit speak here? Do you think? Was it an audible voice? They're, it's like this. They're, they're fasting and praying. Or did a voice come down? Perhaps it was through the prophets because we know at the time in the early church there were prophets and maybe one of them had a revelation from God and gave that. Um, maybe I'm inclined to think that it would as, that was simply that they were fasting and praying and one of the leaders said, I, I sense that the Lord wants Barnabas and Saul to be set aside for the mission of God. And the rest of the church affirmed that. But I think the most important thing to note here is the immediate submission to Christ's command despite the cost. Look at what it says. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now you might ask, why did they? They were, they were worshipping and fasting. They received the uh, message from the Holy Spirit. Why didn't they just say, all right, guys, let's get you together and let's send you off. Why did they fast and pray for them and then send them? Might be, I mean, I think of my terrible mind here and I think, did I get that message right? Lord, you know, Paul and Barnabas, they are so crucial. Do you, are you sure you're speaking correctly here? <laughs> Can we just have them for one more year? We've got this leadership program that they are perfect for. Just one more year and then we'll send them off. This will give us opportunity to finance their ministry. You don't get that sense here. It's like the Holy Spirit says and then they just simply do. But we've got to realize that following the crucified Christ is a costly venture. It's a costly venture when he says, set apart for me this one to go. But I tell you what, I know so many of you have experienced the same thing that we have experienced, that anything given up for God comes back a hundredfold. Jesus himself promised this as the rich man went away sad because Christ said, now sell everything and follow me. And Jesus gives this amazing promise. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this life houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, note that, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This is not saying you give up a house, God will give you a bigger house. I mean, how many families do we have here? <laughs> You're all my family. I'm, all, I'm your family. Right? Um, when Christy and I believed we were called to full-time ministry, there were many questions that naturally rose in our mind. Lord, what does this mean for our children? What does this mean for our finances? What does this mean for our home? When, we're, when, when the Lord called us over to the United States, Lord, we could be staying in the United States. Not that I'm against the United States. I'm now a citizen. But, but this is going to change the trajectory of my life, our life. But I tell you what, Christ has given us so much more. He's given us himself. And when we give up for Christ, Christ becomes so much more real. Everything else is just subservient. I mean, that's just gone. And just to say he gives and gives in abundance to his children. And he certainly met every one of our needs. Godly discontent, when given over to prayer and fasting and seeking God, is a costly proposition. But know this, most, if not all, effective work for Christ will be costly. But there is no life outside of the life that abides with Christ. Such a life is constantly pruned, but there is no other way to fruit bearing. Hold on to your life, you lose it. 
Lose your life, you find it. You want to be first, you're going to be last. Give your life to Christ and let him take care of it. Godly discontent is pursued, causes people to be pursuing Christ in fasting and prayer. Uh, they are the ones who are submissive to the Spirit despite the cost. But thirdly, a godly discontent person must expect opposition. And we see this with Barnabas and Paul. If you could throw up the map, please. Well, let's just clarify where they've gone. Uh, thanks to the ESV Study Bible for this. Um, so you can see Antioch there at the top right corner. And then they traveled to Seleucia, just on the port, the, really the Antioch so, uh, seaport, 30 miles away from Antioch. They took a ship to Cyprus, it says, to Salamis. And then that was about 200 kilometers. They then traveled the whole length of Cyprus and landed in uh, Paphos there. And that's about a journey of 150 kilometers. So 350 kilometers they traveled. And as they were going, they preached and taught, in the, taught the gospel. Uh, they went through their normal process of going to the synagogue, starting with them, and then they would reach out to the Gentiles. And then we pick up the story right over in uh, Paphos. And it says that at that point, they started to experience some opposition in the form of a man named Bar-Jesus, or as Luke called him, Alamus the magician. He was a kind of personal sorcerer to Sergius Paulus, the proconsul of the Roman governor or Roman governor. And Barnabas and Paul were sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, the proconsul had requested them to come to him. And then he's sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. But Alamus, this kind of personal sorcerer, was using, in the words of Paul, all kind of deceit and villainy, verse 9, to turn the proconsul away to come in to Jesus to find life. This was a real spiritual battle. The godly discontented person needs to be willing when they pursue God to expect a spiritual battle. And in our context, it is going to be a clash with a culture of tolerance that is intolerant to the unyielding truth of God. That will eventually lead you into trouble. Did you get that? I have found that when I've spoken to people, they are actually more um, open to the gospel than I would expect. But at times, as we stand on the unyielding, authoritative, inerrant word of God, that will get us, there will be opposition. There will be a spiritual battle at that point. But that's where faith does not capitulate. And Paul and Barnabas were preaching into a pluralistic society and everything seemed to be going fine as they were traveling until they reached this man. Why is that? Why is there opposition? Because the Bible is uncompromising when it says that there is no other name under heaven upon which a man must be saved apart from Jesus. There is no other name. There is no other way to get to heaven. All roads do not lead to heaven, to Christ. It doesn't matter if your faith is so um, honest. If the faith is placed in the wrong thing, it doesn't matter. It's not going to lead anywhere. Jesus said he is the only way. Why? Because he's the only one who was the perfect saviour, perfect man who died for sin, conquered death, and he now calls us to repent and believe in him and be saved. He's the only one. And when we have that sort of myopic declaration of truth, that is going to come with a clash in our pluralistic society. But we've got to expect that when we do that, there is a spiritual battle. And I think this is, and we'll say more about this, but John Mark didn't realize this. It says in verse 5 that they were assisted by John. Uh, he was the cousin of John Mark. He was the cousin of Barnabas, kind of a pastoral intern. And he was probably keen to go 
thought the trip would be fantastic, but he didn't realize that when you stand up for Christ, you, be, you get in the firing line. And often we can get all fired up about the work of God, believing that we can conquer the world only to fall flat on our face. Obedient following the Lord requires a lot more than simply internal zeal and our own puck that requires a deep conviction that as I go, I speak the authority of Christ with the authority of Christ with me. And my only call is to obey him and rest in the Savior's power. To realize that he shoulders the burden, not me. I speak his words, not mine. I'm a messenger of his. And we'll see at the verse 13 that it would seem John Mark couldn't handle it and then goes back and he's sort of reinstated a bit at the end. But we'll talk about him another time. But just simply to say that when you are godly discontent, if you have a godly discontent and you're seeking the Lord in fasting and praying, there's going to be a submissiveness to the cost, but you've got to expect opposition along the way. And fourthly, if we can get that up, you will find satisfaction. You will find satisfaction. Look at verse 10 with me. It says, Paul rebukes Alamus, saying, You are the son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness. Now then notice what he says. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. So you, you who have a godly discontent, know this. Get, could you get the map back up, please? God has straight paths to his people. You have in Pathos a man who was seeking the truth. Then you have in Antioch men, a church, men who are leading their church to say, Lord, what more? And God makes a straight path from Antioch to Pathos. He calls them. He leads them across to Salamis. He leads them straight to Pathos. And he leads them to the man who is seeking faith in him. God makes straight paths to the lost. So you can believe it. Out there, there is people who are lost that God's calling. And he will make us people go straight to them. But don't miss this. No one succeeds in trying to make that straight path crooked. No one will succeed in stopping God to reach his people. Verse 12, Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, that is what had occurred, that Paul rebuked Alamus and he became blind for a time. He saw that and was astonished at the teaching of the Lord and was saved. Not only did God prevent the efforts of Alamos to stop the straight paths of the Lord, he basically threw down Alamos in the path of um, the proconsul to step over him to come to Christ. He even used the rebuke of Alamos to bring him to the Lord Jesus. God is a God on a mission to make straight paths to save the lost. He is not passive he is not disengaged. He is not indecisive. He never coasts. He never drifts. He is always moving. He is always sending, always pursuing, always saving, displaying his mercy for his glory and our greatest joy. And he is calling us to join him. He said, I am, I've come to seek and to save the lost. If we don't join him, he'll use others. We'll be left behind. He's got straight paths. He's doing it. How does the Lord want to use me in that situation? What does, he, what does he want to use? How is he going to use me? Jesus said, and let me leave you with just two thoughts. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Would you pray would you pray and fast even for this church, your involvement in it? What does that look like? The Lord's making the straight paths. He's doing the work. Would you pray and fast for us as we seek to lead the church to know, Lord, what is it? We know what we're called to do. 
But what are the options? What are the pathways? Lord, you've come to seek and to save the lost. And he will always, there will always be hindrances, but he will use the Herods, he'll use the Alamuses simply to make the path, straight path. But also, notice what Antioch did for the sake of God's glory. They were willing to depart with their best. They saw the church not as a social club, but as a word-centered, Christ-centered launching pad. Until we start seeing the church like that, we really don't know what the work of missions is. May God give us each a godly discontent for his glory to our neighbours, to our family, to the nations that will cause us to plead for him in prayer and fasting. Let us pray. Our great and mighty God, Lord, we've just seen the work of God so clearly through these scriptures. Oh, Lord, a, power, a praying, fasting church is a dangerous church. It changes the path of history. We see that in Antioch. History has never been the same with the outflow of that prayer meeting. Europe was conquered by the gospel through Paul and so many others. Oh Lord, we ask that you would truly write these things in our heart, that you would help us to see things the way you see them, that we would have a divine perspective in the realities of this world and that we would submit ourselves to your rule and reign in everything. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.